We are blessed with Suzette, our office administrator, and I want to be very clear that what you see in the bulletin is not a mistake. She typed exactly what she was given. I worked hard all week researching that scripture and planning to preach on Jonah, which was the next story in April's um, sermon series. She told me when she asked me to preach that I didn't have to stick with the theme, and I said, oh, I will, no problem. On Thursday, Suzette said, oh, I wish that preachers didn't work so hard on their sermons because by lunch, nobody remembers what you talked about. <laughs> well, and you know, for this week, that was comforting <laughs> because I really studied a lot and wrote a lot. And at the end of the week, I said out loud, God, I think this sermon stinks. And I heard the voice of the Lord say, you're not wrong. So I began again with where my heart has been. Like a lot of you, the last four or five weeks has been a tough year. It's been a lot between the violence in Ukraine and in Uvalde and Monday in Duncanville. I'm just weary. So I have switched to Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 38. Listen for the word of the Lord. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you, if anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from who you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven give, and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap, for the measure you give will be the measure you get back. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I don't know about y'all, but I have gotten to the place this week where I just can't watch the news. And I've been a news watcher since late elementary school. My mind has circled back many times this week to something that happened to me in the early 2000s. For many years, I've been a sexual assault response volunteer. I go on call at the local hospitals, and when somebody comes in and reports that they've been assaulted, I'm called out as an advocate to be with that person when the police come and the nurse examiner comes. And I'm with that person not as a counselor, but as a listening ear and an advocate to help them through the long 
and terrifying process of exam and police reporting. I don't remember, sadly, every person that I've met in these times because there have just been so many since 1993 when I started doing this. But one high school girl stands out in my memory. We don't talk about faith, or I don't bring it up. That's not allowed, but frequently clients do. And this girl was talking a lot about her faith, and it led me to ask the question, what do you think God is feeling right now? And she said, I think God is really sad because I'm his child, and so is the man who did this to me. In that moment, I wasn't sure she needed me at all. But when I see things like what happened in Uvalde or in Duncanville or just in our neighborhoods, just the petty fights and families, all the cruel little things that aren't so little that humans do to one another, I'm reminded of that wise girl and the scripture. Enemy is defined as a person who is actively opposed or hostile to someone or something, a foe, an adversary, opponent, a rival, a nemesis, antagonist, combatant. It would seem then impossible to love an enemy, for an enemy who is loved is no longer an enemy. We might say that we can love an enemy if we only try harder. Perhaps we might search for a more spiritual definition of what it means to love. Maybe we could sweep this demand under a rug of reference to ancient understandings towards en enemies. Yet nothing will reduce the demand of the passage. As with so many other passages, examination within context may help us understand what is being said here. Luke 6, 27 makes the transition in the Sermon on the Plain away from the Beatitudes and towards specific concerns regarding the treatment of the enemy. The opening of verse 27 says, but I say to you that listen, it recalls the earlier setting of the sermon. They had come to hear him and anticipates the closing of the sermon. Jesus addresses the disciples, those who are committed to hearing even what they cannot fully comprehend. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. The active, verbal character of these demands is crucial. Love in this passage is not so much a noun, a characteristic, an emotional state, as it is an action. While it may be impossible to feel love for an enemy, it's not impossible to act in certain ways for those whom experience has shown to be our most entrenched opponents. What Jesus means by love of enemies becomes clear in the three verbal demands that follow the explicit demand, do good, bless, pray. He goes on to give several concrete examples of what it looks like to love an enemy. A believer who is struck should offer the other cheek a disciple whose coat is taken should offer the next layer of clothing as well. No beggar should be turned away. No one who takes away possessions should be asked to return them. With the exception of the first, all of these specific examples concern possessions, which is in line with Luke's emphasis elsewhere in the role of one's handling of possessions as profoundly revealing of one's capacity for discipleship. Then we come to verse 31, to what has come to be called the golden rule. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Why? Why should it be that disciples of Jesus must love their enemies? 
No promise is made that loving them will convert an enemy to a friend, that it'll modify the enemy's behavior, or even alter one's own feelings toward that enemy. Instead, Jesus explores the established alternative behavior of equitable exchange, loving only those who love in return, loving only those who love us is not credit, for even sinners can do that. Surely, disciples of Jesus should hold ourselves to higher standards. With verses 35 through 36, we come to the final restatement of the demand and the underlying reason, but love your enemies, do good, and lend, expending, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. How does any of this apply today? If you've listened to my children's moments over the years, you've likely picked up on a story or two about my childhood. I would not give up my role in the Maloney family pecking order for anything. I love the fact that my dad retired when I was in the first grade and I got to spend a lot of time with him growing up. The other side of being the youngest in a family of many children is that my parents had everything figured out by the time I came along. When my sister Molly and I would get into an argument over something silly and it escalated into a sibling battle complete with hurtful words, mom would tell us, go tell your sister you're sorry. And as we marched off to make the mandatory apology, she'd add from the kitchen and say it like you mean it. Oh, that was always the part that stung. The love your enemy part. We were always good for storming by with a sassy, I'm sorry, in a voice that clearly said, we were not. But say it like you mean it, put a whole new spin on things. In essence, mom was teaching us to act in love towards one another. Of course, that's a humorous childhood example that most of us can relate to. But what do we do when the stakes get higher? I knew a young woman in seminary who had strong differences with a pastor in her denomination. The seminarian tells of a time when she was invited to serve communion, communion at a denominational gathering. She was serving at one of two stations and the pastor in question was coming forward. Even as she served those who came up to her she was distracted by him in the back of the room. Under her breath, she began to think, please don't get in my line, please don't get in my line. Her feelings of enmity toward him were so consuming that she didn't want to share the Lord's Supper with him. He got in her line. She served him the bread and the cup. Something in their relationship changed in that experience. She says that experience informed the way she understands the command to love your enemy. And what about possessions? If someone takes something that is yours, you're to give them even more? Would you pay them to get back what they took? Google one of the most valuable domains on the internet, google.com, was accidentally sold for $12 in 2015. The buyer was a former employee, Sanmay Ved, who discovered that google.com was on a list of domain names available for sale. He bought it and charged the $12 to his credit card, not really expecting anything to come of it. He said, I was hoping I would get an error at some point saying the transaction didn't go through. But he didn't expect to complete the purchase. But his credit card was actually charged. He told CNN Money that he made the purchase simply out of curiosity. He thought at some point they'd block him out, but he wanted to see how far it would go. 
the transaction didn't go far. For about a minute, he said during that brief minute, he got a flood of information from Google users, though he was not actually able to change the Google homepage. Then he got an email from Google canceling the transaction. Bed had worked for Google for five and a half years. Google admits that Ved owned the domain, albeit very temporarily. The company offered him $6,006.13, which is the numerical version of the word Google. You have to squint a little to see it. When Google learned that Ved didn't intend to keep the money but instead donate it to charity, the company doubled the reward. Ved, who's from India, directed that money to be given to the Art of Living India Foundation. The group runs free schools in parts of that country where poverty and child labor are widespread. Google could have immediately offered a huge sum of money to Ved, or they could have had their legal department pen a letter attempting to get out of the sale at no cost whatsoever. We'll never know what the corporation's immediate perception of Ved was. But clearly, it had the potential to create a corporate nightmare. While Jesus' command to love your enemy and do to others as you would have them do to you were given to his believers, they also proved to be good business practice for Google. Whether you're an insolent sibling, a student pastor, a billion-dollar corporation, or anywhere in between, it seems the path to loving our enemies goes through treating them as we ourselves would like to be treated and doing it like we mean it. Let us pray. Loving God, it is so easy to show love to those who also show love to us. Help us to love those whom we sometimes find difficult. Help us to remember that all are your children and all are loved by you. Amen.